I don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl, but I do know what's really important on Sunday, your weather. This is CBC Here and Now. It's a significant amount of money for us. I'm just praying that something, a miracle will happen. Who robs a charity? Why the break-in might force Take Two to shut down. My dad loved 50 cars. And why a rusty old wreck sits in the middle of Happy Valley Goose Bay just rusting and rusting. Good evening. Tonight, a St. John's charity is facing major challenges. Take Two Second Hand Store is run by Empower, a support group for people with disabilities. Well, the storefront there was smashed in and someone made off with the safe. And as you're about to see, it's just the latest in a string of setbacks. I was shocked, uh, very disheartened. Um, it's been a, a very difficult January for us. It's been a difficult year for us. We've had uh, our donation bottle stolen. We had our office at Empower broken into. Uh, the alarm system went off and now this. So it seems to be escalating. And $3,000 might not seem like a lot of money for people, but for a small charity that's uh, running a social enterprise, it's a significant amount of money for us. We need to make some tough decisions in regards to what we're gonna be doing in the future. We really need the community to support us right now. We were closed during the snowstorm. We paid our staff and right now we're we're running at a deficit, so we really need some help from the community, maybe from government as well. Who would do this to a nonprofit organization? You know, this is for people with disabilities. Myself, I got a disability. You probably can't see my disability, but I do got a disability. And I've been here now going on over three years working, sure. and I love it here. This is my lovelihood, right? I enjoy coming here every day. A lot of people are shocked. A lot of people that are coming into the store are saying they're shocked that anyone would steal from a charity to begin with. We're getting support. You know, what can we do to help? We actually had uh, a woman call and give us a $200 donation, which we really, really, really appreciate. And uh, I guess we're looking for more of that, more charitable. Um, shop local, that's what we're, we're promoting right now. So, you know, take two as a charity and we're, we're giving back to people. So we really want, uh, we need support from the community. I'm just praying that something, a miracle will happen. I hope so. You might recall Here and Now went live from that location just last year. Some really great people there who do great work. Now, the RNC says it's reviewing camera footage from the area of Rope Walk Lane where Take Two is located, and anybody with any possible information is asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. A Canada Revenue Agency, on to other news now, worker is facing fraud charges after allegedly stealing from her union. 59-year-old Lola Parsons was a spokesperson for the Public Service Alliance Committee. Now, it's alleged that she used her position with the union to forge checks and cash them between 2016 and 2017. Now, around that same time, she spoke with CBC News about her struggles with the broken Phoenix federal payroll system. It affects us when we go to work every day because everybody's under financial stress and it's hard to perform the duties of your job when you have financial stress on your mind. Well, it was a quiet day today. We did see some sunshine, but we do have those flurries making their way back in uh, for the northeast, even along the west coast as well. An area of high pressure just to the east of us is going to clear things out through the day tomorrow as that heads a little bit further uh, towards the island. So it's actually a pretty nice Saturday, but uh, doesn't look like much right now. But this area of cloud cover is going to ramp up as we head through the next couple of days and head our way. That's our next weather maker Sunday night into Monday. It looks messy for the island. Some uh, snow changing over to rain. It's going to be pretty windy as well. I'll have all those details coming up. Well, thanks, Ashley. Now, an update to a story that we brought you last night. It's about the man from Ontario who survived our brutal blizzard, but then got stuck with a brutal bill from a St. John's rental car company. Derek Wilkins rented a car for two days, but he got charged for a full week because the city was under a state of emergency. Well, Wilkins wasn't allowed to drive that vehicle during that time. It was against the rules. Roads were closed, and he couldn't return it because Enterprise was closed and, oh yeah, right, so was the airport where the Enterprise counter is located. Well, after our story aired last night, Wilkins said the company gave him a full refund. 
Well, the province is promising money to repair some of all that blizzard damage. The assistance is going to be available to homeowners, businesses, as well as municipalities. And it will not, it will cover damage not covered, rather, under normal insurance plans. Municipal Affairs Minister Derek Bragg says those without insurance are not eligible for this help. People have about three months to apply. Now, this is how it's going to work. The province is going to cover the first $1.6 million worth of claims. And after that, the costs are going to be shared with the federal government. Staying with that blizzard, the city of St. John's released some figures today about the big storm. Just take a look at this. The city hauled away 16,000 dump truck loads of snow. It had about 20 of those really big blowers that we all saw and has now opened up about 98% of the streets to two-way traffic. It also says 60% of the sidewalks are now clear. Statistics Canada also revealed some info. It says the blizzard affected nearly 210,000 people in 86,000 households. That's almost half of the province's population. Well, even though the state of emergency is over, the acts of kindness keep happening. A company that's headquartered in St. John's is trying to help local restaurants get back on their feet. And one employee at a time is getting there. Here now is Meg Roberts with that story. Restaurants in the area are trying to bounce back after going more than a week without making a sale. A local company is trying to make that easier. Vision 33 is giving each of their 150 employees $10 a day to buy lunch from a local business. What we want our employees to do is get out of the office, go to some of these local restaurants, which they're often doing anyway, but perhaps give them some extra incentive to do so. The IT services company says it wasn't affected by the storm as their business operates globally, and they wanted to give back to local restaurants who might not have been as fortunate, while also thanking their staff for working so hard throughout the state of emergency. We were fortunate enough not to be impacted significantly from a revenue perspective. So being from here, and having been that fortunate, it only made sense to find a way to, to give back. The company is also encouraging employees to post on their personal social media accounts about the restaurants they're visiting and hopes to attract others to visit as well. A lot of them, you know, are, this time of year would be struggling anyway just through the nature of that business. So uh, a lot of them are, are appreciative uh, and I think that they're actually seeing some benefit out of this and, and, and that's important. I mean, it's not just about promotion, uh, it's about being a part of this community. The Board of Trade has sent a letter to the Prime Minister asking for financial relief for employees and small business owners as the city continues to clean up from that record-breaking snowfall. Meg Roberts, CBC News. St. John's. Well, moving away from blizzard stories, Nalcor has announced another setback for the Muskrat Falls transmission software, and it could add months to the efforts to complete the Labrador Island link. A statement from Nalcor today says the critical software for the power line linking Labrador to the Avalon Peninsula will now be delivered sometime this year. And that's a shift from previous schedules, which said the final version would be ready by June. So this could add up to six months to the schedule. Now GE is developing the software, but the company has missed several deadlines, with Nalcor describing those delays as, quote, disappointing. The setback is significant, though, because commercial power from the first of four turbines at Muskrat is expected in March. Well, at a meeting in Happy Valley Goose Bay last night, residents got a say in what they want to see in the next provincial budget, and the consensus was clear. Labradorians want better access to medical services, and many express concern about the cost of flying out of northern Labrador to see a doctor or a dentist. One suggestion that was made, why not bring medical personnel and their equipment to remote areas instead of flying the patients out? Well, a company that has been operating in this province for 154 years received some special rec recognition for its longevity today. A. Harvey & Company was one of five recipients of an award from Turning the Tide, an organization that celebrates the province's marine history. A. Harvey has been in business in St. John's since 1865, longer than the city has been incorporated, and it's still located on Water Street. It's involved in many areas of the marine industry, including custom brokerage as well as offshore supply services. The Industry Leadership and Excellence Award is an 
uh, awarded to an outstanding business that has demonstrated leadership, innovation, and integrity in its own growth and in support of the industry at whole. From their humble beginnings in 1865 to becoming a household name, this company has been serving the people of Newfoundland and Labrador for over 150 years. Under the direction of matriarch Susan Patton, this company enjoys the distinction of being one of Newfoundland's most historic and diversified firms and is a vital and integral part of the Newfoundland and Labrador economy the moviegoers in Mount Pearl could soon be enjoying alcoholic beverages with their blockbuster. The city gave Cineplex Cinemas the go-ahead to apply for a liquor license, so now the decision is in the hands of the province's liquor corporation. The NLC will now conduct a pre-licensing inspection before it makes a ruling on whether or not to give the theatre the green light for alcohol. Well, one of the province's hottest young comedians is hitting the stage for a string of sold-out shows. Mike Lynch is best known for his viral videos, and now he's bringing his act to theaters. His, cur his current tour is coming to St. John's as well as Cornerbrook, and the tickets have been all snapped up. Here now, Zach Gowdy caught up with Lynch this afternoon. I'm living in Alberta right now where no one knows who the hell I am, so now I come back and I forget that people, you know, people watch my videos and stuff. So. Mike, you're in the middle of a tour. What's life on the road like for a traveling comedian? Just gonna film me, you're gonna help me out. Gotta remind ourselves to be grateful, like our jobs are pretty, pretty different. You've been doing stand-up comedy for a long time, but a lot of people know you from your videos. Hello boys, say hello Brian here. Young fella, how do I get me new TV work? How does it change your approach to comedy when you go from making videos to doing a live show? You only got one take, so, right, don't screw it up. You just gotta be up there, there's no editing, so you can't make the timing better. Like, sometimes you'll film something that's not even that funny, but you splice it all together, and then suddenly it's something fit to look at. Do people on the street recognize Mike Lynch, or do they recognize Cecil? Um, it's, it, it's, it's getting, like, at first it was just Cecil, that was it. But as years went on, it's like, oh, it's Mike Lynch. You're a fakeish little punk, a pathetic looking sight. You claim you drink like a fish while you're sick after three course life. Sometimes, like, I'll be out and like people just know me as uh, a character or whatever. They're like, Cecil boy, come over and say something to me, Snapchat, and I'll just be like, Oh, hey, how's it going, man? Like, that's not Cecil. And it'd be like super, like. Just disappointed, like, what, you're not hilarious or Cecil all the time? Like, what is this? Lord God, I hope no one's driving today. The local comedian Mike Lynch, it's every day. He grabs his accordion and slowly makes his way to the stage. Just an every day for this local comedian. What do you enjoy more, making videos or performing in front of audiences? I like performing in front of audience because you get the immediate, like, you know, if something works immediately and you just get the rush and, uh, it's harder, and it's just what I first fell in love with. Like, my first love is stand-up comedy. St. John's don't let go of, of structures. You ever go to a downtown house? Now, the basement here has a... The basement has a beautiful dirt floor finish. You're here in St. John's for a stretch of shows, then on to Cornerbrook. They're all sold out. What's it like for you when you roll up into town and you know that people are waiting to see you? Definitely a big relief because uh, I get to work on the show and not have to worry about was anyone gonna come come see me or what? Because when I started off, right, you'd be uh, you'd be fighting to get 20 people out. Usually, something we do in a video, we'll never do it live or stuff live. We'll usually never do in a video, so we try and give people something new every time. I should have practiced. And thanks to Zach Gowdy for putting that item together. Well, staying with the arts, but to a sad story now, Lloyd Pretty has died at the age of 75. Born in Chapel Arm, the prominent painter called Stephenville home for decades. Well, here's more now on his life as well as his artistic legacy from our Troy Turner. Lloyd Pretty's artwork speaks to the province. It tells the story of simpler times, rural living, and a province we rarely still see whether through shinny on the ice, untainted wilderness, or colorful characters. Pretty's work is Newfoundland and Labrador. His ultimate love of, of our province 
uh, and in particular the uh, the rural component of our province, the natural beauty, um, the activities that people participated in, how they made a living. That was his main inspiration, in, in my opinion. Up until a decade ago, Pretty was busy with painting and printmaking. He slowed down in later years, but continued to paint. Back in 1980, Pretty told CBC News he's proud of being self-taught. It was completely uh, on my own. I dropped out of school, grade nine education, and uh, uh, that was really a flaw. I felt bad about that. I felt that would keep me back more than anything else, you know. But now I think it's the, one of the best things ever happened to me. Pretty had prostate cancer. He was 75 years old. I guess art can have different purposes, and it needs to be acknowledged that it has different purposes. It's not just for um, a certain type of person living in a certain area. It has, it's wide-reaching, and a bunch of different people can enjoy artwork. And to me, Lloyd was the ultimate example of that. Buckle dealt with Pretty professionally for the last 20 years. It was his daughter's interest, however, in the form of a school project where he got to know Pretty more personally. He was an interesting person. Um, I was always happy to, have, to, to see him. It was always good to have a chat with him. He was a very prolific artist. He was painting all the time. And, uh, yeah, I, I found Lloyd to be a very nice person, and I'm really glad that I knew him. Lloyd Pretty has said about his work that it captures carefree and happy times when life was less complicated than it is today. If there's one legacy this body of work will leave behind is the images of those days long ago. Troy Turner, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, our departing Labrador reporter Jacob Barker told you last night that he had one more story left for Here and Now viewers, and he pointed out that sometimes the stories, well, they're all around us, and sometimes it just takes a little bit of digging. And so Jacob did that when he looked into the story of a rusty old wreck that sits right smack in the middle of Happy Valley Goose Bay. So here's Jacob Barker now with his final Here and Now story. An old abandoned car. I like the grill in it. It's a mean looking grill. It looks like somebody's got, got buck teeth and a smack you in the mouth with it. Tells a story. Last year she was licensed in Newfoundland. It was 1973. The old 53 Dodge DeSoto, brought in the 60s by an American military member. I assume this is the gentleman who brought the goose way, though. Joe Maynard. Captain Joe Maynard. But it also holds other stories, like the one you're about to hear, about a father and a son. He hated to see cars go to the dump. He had this yard at one time held. I believe when we cleaned it up, it was 175 vehicles. All cars that my dad one time was going to do up one of these days. John Blake's father, Percy Stanley, used to own a garage here, Superb Motors. A Super B, as some people used to call it. It burnt down in 1989. Well, what's, what's left of us right here? Huh? Stanley passed away 20 years later. His son says he was known to be an honest mechanic and a good one. He would never see anybody stuck. If you came here and you had a problem, he would try his best to help you. But also stubborn if you challenged his wisdom. Don't piss him off because he'd tell you off. <laughs> the DeSoto was one of many project cars Stanley had on the go. When it came around to getting work done, it could take a while. Yes, he started a lot, he started a lot of projects but never finished them. This Jeep Wagoneer he wanted to fix up in 1973 for his wife. Mom used it for one year and dad put it in the garage, going to do it for mom one of these days. Still not finished. Stanley's passion clearly showed, especially when it came to fixing up old cars. My dad loved 50s cars. He was a 50s kind of guy. And each old car here holds a memory. Every one that came to the yard, I, I, I played in every one. I, and, I, and I pretend I drove every one. It was something to be proud of, I guess. These days, Blake's first priority isn't the DeSoto. I've had this car since I was 15 years old. I've been wanting to rebuild it since I was 15 years old. It's this 73 Dodge Dart. For a teenager, it was a, it was a sporty car. This is a two-door car, yeah. and it can make, it make a nice, nice little car, right? A passion passed from father to son continues. If I wanted a Newfoundland retirement package, yeah. not one of these cars would be sold, not one. Yeah. The unexpected story of a rusty old car. There's a lot of those. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay.
This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. I'm not sure where you are, but I know in my case this morning, getting out to shovel that dust thing that we got, it was <laughs> yeah. beautifully sunny. It was gorgeous this, this afternoon morning. It was kind of cooler. Yeah, yeah, temperatures were, uh, I mean, we dropped last night, but uh, temperatures didn't really move much from that. Right. And uh, expected that yesterday, but uh, temperatures right across the board were actually sitting in the mid minus single digits there's the temperatures there that's pretty much where where the west coast has been sitting for the past couple of days so we're just seeing those uh cooler temperatures head a little bit further east and then relatively mild up through uh labrador city uh, sitting at about minus 13 today uh, we did see some uh, flurries move in and after those sunny skies earlier today we are seeing some flurries on the west coast as well so that will generally continue as we head through the night tonight as this uh, area of low pressure uh, continues to pull away and then uh, replace that with an area of high pressure and uh, that means things are going to clear out. So you're looking at the chance of flurries and or freezing drizzle ending as we head uh, into the early morning hours tomorrow. Quiet up through Labrador as well. Another cool uh, night though for most of us. Not quite as cool as it has been for Lab City though. Only going down to about minus 17 tonight. So your temperatures really aren't moving much. And then we've got temperatures in the minus double digits for the majority of central uh, St. John's down to minus nine. Those winds are going to stay breezy, though, again, northwesterlies uh, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. And then on the west coast, you're looking at about 15 to 20 kilometers per hour uh, through the day or rather through the night tonight. Now tomorrow that high pressure holds place, but we are going to see some increasing cloud uh, as we start to see some of that high cirrus, cirrus move in before the low pressure system moves in and that's going to affect us through the weekend. Uh, but temperatures are actually going to be a little bit cooler as well tomorrow, looking at uh, widespread areas of between minus six, maybe even minus nine as you head towards uh, Clarenville and then staying pretty steady on the west coast, minus four for Corner Brook, but plenty of sunshine in the mix. Might see a few flurries as well up through Twillingate, uh, maybe down through Burgio as well, but overall not a whole lot happening. So it will be a, a lovely afternoon to enjoy if you're bundled up. Some flurries possible for Lab City as well. Southwesterlies uh, quite uh, breezy, or not breezy rather, uh, quite light, 15 kilometers per hour. And then we've got plenty of sunshine across the big land, about minus 10 for Cartwright. So uh, talking about that system on Sunday, we do have a special weather statement in effect for all of the island. And then up through uh, at least the southwestern portion, uh, or rather the southeastern portion of the big land into uh, Sunday and then Monday. So here's a look at that low pressure system. This takes us through Saturday. So you're going to see this system uh, strengthen as it head towards the maritime provinces. And by Sunday early morning is when we're going to start to see that snow uh, for the south coast, uh, even into the Avalon. And that's going to come pretty quickly. So we're going to see a lot of snow fall at a, a very fast amount. And then it does look like things will change over uh, late afternoon. Uh, for the majority of eastern uh, portions of the uh, island. Certainly for uh, the Avalon, we're going to see some pretty heavy rain with this as well. As of now, heaviest snow looks like it will fall uh, somewhere between central and the west coast through the day on Sunday, and then that will move north, and then we'll start to see that snow up through uh, the big land. But again, with this system, we're looking at some winds as well. I'll have all the details. We'll time it out. I'll tell you how much snow and rain is on the way in a little bit. Anthony? Thank you, Ashley. A provincial court judge has condemned two former high schoolers for behavior that he calls abhorrent, and it happened on a trip for a school sports team. Here now is Garrett Barry has the details on this case, but first I should warn you, some of the details you're about to hear about may be upsetting. Garrett. It is an incident that a defense lawyer has described as high school hazing. It is also one that the Crown attorney and the judge in this case have called nonetheless very serious. It happened here in the town of Gander in 2016. A high school sports team took a trip here that year and older members of the team started a so-called initiation of newer members. The description of the event, the description of the event rather comes from an agreed upon statement of facts and I am going to read from some of those right now. It is inside a Gander hotel room that senior members of the team told two newer members to take off some clothes. They held them down on a hotel room bed and showed them gay sexual images while someone rubbed their underwear. 
After that, senior members turned their attention to a third and a fourth victim. Those victims were also newer members of the team. They were held down while a senior member rubbed up against them. This incident was not reported to police, coaches or teachers for a whole year. One of the victims eventually told the coach that what they did last year was not fit. In 2018, police announced charges against five youth. They faced charges of assault and sexual interference in relation to those incidents. In court today, two of the senior members were sentenced for their role in the event. They pled guilty to charges of assault and other charges were withdrawn. They each received a conditional discharge. That means they will have conditions to abide by, but this conviction can be removed from their criminal record. A defense lawyer said the youth had been hazed when they were younger, when they were newer members of the team, and were in turn hazing others. He said that was a mistake. The provincial court judge had harsh words for those actions. He said the behavior has no place in polite society. He said it was abhorrent. He said that when these two young men are in positions of power over other younger athletes, they need to be the ones to put a stop to this type of behavior. Reporting live from Gander, I'm Garrett Berry. I just want to thank all of you working today for this terrific broadcast. The Nationals' Adrienne Arsenault was here for our blizzard. On Here and Now, she's going to explore the power of radio on this island during a time of crisis.
was Ashley mentioned, we've got another system heading our way. Yes, but it's not going to be nearly what it was two weeks ago this time. Right, and now two weeks ago, of course, CBC very busy. And one of those people was Adrienne Arsenault with The National. She was here doing many stories, and one of the things she came away from her experience here was about the power of radio. The snow came right on schedule. No hype or exaggeration. It was as bad as predicted. Bondo up in blanket because it's not safe to be out. All right, thanks. Uh, stay safe out there. Another certainty much, that too. they would be busy. All right. Because no We're matter technology's 10, march of 30, time in no. crises. We declared a state of emergency at 4.30 today. Old school radio programs are the no warm hearths to together. We want to know what are you going through? Kind you voices know, cutting through the roar of that now. wind. And Newfoundlanders had no idea how vital those so voices would prove to be. This is Chrissy Holmes of the St. John's Morning Show. When they start talking 70 centimeters of snow, but the fallout things started to get interesting because people really didn't know what a state of emergency was going to mean. Nobody was prepared for this. By that Friday afternoon, as the snow descended and the sky darkened, those forced to retreat indoors reached out. People rarely surprised by the weather, somehow struck by the novelty of this storm and wanting to share. I'm making haggis. It, and do you do this often on storm days? <laughs> I kind of want to build a fort. Yeah? Yeah. Very quickly, it became clear that reaching out wasn't just about sharing an experience, but asking for help. I just want to thank all of you working today for this terrific broadcast. That's a woman named I, Kathy I calling into CBC St. John's Friday afternoon. Oh, she has mobility issues and was getting worried, especially because she was alone. I'm sitting here alone in the dark, not because we've had a power outage. It's all the large windows I have are covered, smothered with snow, mm -hmm. but it's weird in the middle of the day to be sitting in the dark. Oh my goodness. And have it's, it... it's kind of lonely. The idea of being almost entombed by the snow made for an isolation not everyone was ready for. There are waves coming over the seawall and hitting the third floor of my home. So it looks like something out of Hollywood special effects. 110 kilometers an hour, those winds, and it was around supper time that the power started going for thousands in the Avalon Peninsula. We've heard from here. I want to hear from you. What's this Ted Blades like in St. John's was shepherding the afternoon coverage. Two of our colleagues left here trying to go two blocks to the hotel where we had places to sleep for the night. They left on snowshoes with full suits on, and they didn't get to the end of the parking lot. They turned around and came back and said the winds were just too strong. Fifteen of us ended up sleeping on the floor here in the station because we simply couldn't leave. Then it got worse. CBC Newfoundland lost power, too. That lifeline suddenly needed one. 20,000 customers were without power in our last it's, check. Uh, St. John's, Mount Pearl, North, there are about 10,000 customers without power. So the Nova Scotia Bureau stepped in, fielding the Newfoundland calls that kept coming deep into the night and through the weekend. I'm in an area called Monday Pond, which seems to be the uh, epicenter of this whole storm <laughs> because it's been savage here. It's just been nasty and... Uh, you know, with flashes of light, which I guess are generators blowing up, uh, you like to actually see lightning. Listening behind the mic, Jeff Douglas in Halifax. I'm somebody with an anxiety disorder, so I okay. have panic attacks. <laughs> but I live in, an, you know, the Jelly Bean Row, so I have neighbors oh, that yes. were, were glued together. And uh, she said, if by chance we lose phone service, she said, just pound on our phone. <laughs> yes. Well, it's good to have someone so close. It's pretty scary, too, I have to say. Listen, oh. Deborah, knock yeah. on your neighbor's wall if you if you get <laughs> yeah. if you oh, start yeah. to get anxious and if everything else fails, call us yeah. back here, all right? Yeah. Information is treasured currency in a crisis. Trading it matters. Easier said than done in a store. Oh yeah, the house is covered over almost. Oh, good Lord. Wow. And as to be honest with you, we're really grateful to you for calling because we're having a hard time getting through to people. And um, we have to do that part to keep things going at a time like this. It's a 2020 storm and they're going to come around on Mother Nature. You're not fucking her. She's going to do her thing. No, she doesn't. She doesn't mess around. Gus, thanks so much for calling. Be well. 10-4, boy.
You've seen what happened over the next 72 hours when the snow gave up and the sun came out. We gotta thank the city workers. They're out working their butts off. It's a massive undertaking. People are worn down, right? Mm -hmm. They're hurting physically. I wanna ask the community to, you know, check on your neighbor, certainly seniors, make sure that they have what they need. Newfoundlanders emerged from those snow caves and got to work lifting each other. But without power, without work, sometimes without company, it still wasn't easy. Ted Blades back on the air in Newfoundland now, reconnected with Kathy, the woman with mobility issues who'd called days earlier and was nervous in her darkened house. We put out the call to have her neighbors come and try and see if she was all right. People had showed up to help her because they heard her on the radio. Her relief and then eventually a province's relief. The snow safely shoved out of harm's way meant the calls changed. But they kept coming, five, six, steady three, streams eight, two, of five, thank yous. Five, and also people are calling in and sharing some incredible stories of human connection. My children have been shoveling forever. In the midst of adversity, you can find things to be grateful for. Them feeling that you must have had to see that help had arrived. <laughs> I couldn't believe the tears in my eyes, of course. I couldn't help it. It was just incredible. I'm so, thank you so to wonderful. all the strangers who stepped up. Sorry, I'm clubbed right now. Yeah. And thanks for the intimacy of radio that friend that weathers the storm. That was my little cameo there at the end there. That I am from Adrian Arsenault from The National. You can tune into the program, The National, tonight at 10.30 Newfoundland time, 10 o'clock in most of Labrador for the latest on that story, of course, as well as national and international news. There's another case of coronavirus in Canada, the fourth person in this country with a confirmed infection. Now, one is in hospital in Vancouver, while two others are in the Toronto area. And this latest case, a woman in her late 20s, is in London, Ontario. She arrived there from Wuhan, China last week. Medical experts say there is virtually no risk to the public because this woman apparently took all possible precautions. Uh, this is somebody who actually wore the equivalent of, of surgical mask for her entire travel from Wuhan to London, even though she didn't have symptoms at the time. She went straight into isolation in her home when she returned home. Uh, the only time she's been out of her home since then is to hospital for testing, and again, wore the equivalent of a surgical mask, 
uh, to protect others. Now, health officials say the woman is no longer ill, but does remain in isolation. Her levels of the virus were so low that a first test was negative. Now, word of that fourth case comes as Canada's first coronavirus patient was released from hospital. Now, he remains in isolation with his wife at home. Meanwhile, in China, the death toll from the outbreak continues to rise up to 213 as of today. The UK and Russia are reporting their first patients, 23 nations in all, now affected by the coronavirus. Britain's divorce from the European Union becomes official today at 11 p.m. London time. The long and often bitter process has left the United Kingdom anything but united. We just need to get back together, get on with it now, you know, it's, what's done is done. You know, we need a bit of unity. And I think all this has done is, is divide the country. Um, and we just need to get back to where we are. Absolutely gutted, depressed, hate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's the worst thing this country could ever do. Well, the split may be done, but there is still uncertainty about the new relationship between Britain and the European Union. An 11 month transition period now begins for the two sides to negotiate issues over trade and commerce. The 27 remaining EU nations now consider Britain a foreign state. So the British Embassy in Brussels will be known as the UK mission to the European Union. Well, Nike's Vaporfly will be allowed in the Tokyo Olympics. The controversial shoe has been under scrutiny for its performance enhancing effects and some have called for a ban of the shoe. Instead, World Athletics says it's putting in place tighter rules for high-tech running shoes. They include a ban on any shoe which has a sole thicker than 40 millimeters, as well as any shoe that has more than one rigid embedded plate or blade. The new rules also require shoes used in competition after April 30th to have been available to the public for at least four months. Well, last October, Iliad Kipcho G ran a record-breaking marathon in under two hours. Now, under the new rules, the shoes he wore then, those shoes, they're banned. Staying with sports, a doctor with the Kansas City Chiefs will have one of the most important jobs at the Super Bowl this Sunday. Not as part of the medical staff, but on the field with the Chiefs as they take on the San Francisco 49ers. Canadian Laurent Duvernay-Tardif is a star lineman and the McGill Medical School graduate is about to become the first ever medical doctor to play in the NFL championship. By all appearances, he's your typical NFL offensive guard. Big and strong. But for number 76 Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, Braun comes with a big brain. In between practices and games, the Quebecer managed to become a doctor. Sunday, another milestone. He'll be the first doctor to play in a Super Bowl. With that distinction comes media attention and unexpected questions at football press conferences. <laughs> Are we really going to talk about that? It's probably one of the most uh, interesting person I know. Charles-Alexandre Lacroix will be watching from the stands in Miami on Sunday. Salut. He met Duvernay Tardif in med school and even brought him in for a shift in the ER. He was able to go through med school. He's able to perform at the highest level of sports, and yet he's very down to earth. In between football and medicine, <laughs> Duvernay Tardif also finds time for his foundation, encouraging kids to play sports. He did a stint as a sports reporter, and he can bake. Duvernay Tardif spent his teens working in bakeries owned by his parents. For the team here, his accomplishments are a source of pride. He's doing great at the sport that he loves, and he's doing great at his career. So, I mean, who else can do like uh, say like, oh, I ha hi, I'm a doctor from McGill and I'm playing the Super Bowl. So, how does the doctor square playing football in a league facing concerns about concussions, and evidence the sport could lead to brain degeneration? At the end of the day, you, you gotta look at the big picture, you know, and, and people who do team sport, people who, who are active, people who, who play football are usually, I think, better leader, better human, uh, that are more balanced. His next goal, bringing home that Super Bowl ring. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal.
I can, see, I can see a lot of 49er fans just changing allegiance now after seeing this guy. Wow. Yeah, I mean, just proves you can do whatever you want. Uh, your dreams can come true. Doctor, no matter what you do. Super Bowl. And he can bake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very dreamy. The weather update is brought to you by Beltone, your partner in better hearing. Well, we keep talking about the forecast on Sunday. Here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise. We're going to see a warm up uh, for parts of central uh, towards the Avalon. That's why we're going to see things change over terrain. Otherwise, you're going to stay on the cold side of that on the west coast up through uh, Labrador. You're looking at temperatures in the minus uh, double digits, but it's going to be quiet other than uh, the southeastern portion of the big land. Here's what I'm thinking uh, as far as what we're going to see. So more than likely anywhere from 15 to 30 plus centimeters on the west coast as you head towards central. That's more like 15 to 25 centimeters. You're looking at drizzle as well and probably closer to about five millimeters of rain as you head towards the Bonavista Peninsula, Clarenville as well. Now, when we get to the Avalon at this point, it's looking like we could see anywhere from 10 to about 20 centimeters of snow. Then that changes over to rain and we could see anywhere from 20 to 30 millimeters with this system. Uh, southern areas of the Avalon closer to 30 to 40 millimeters. The other thing we're going to pay attention to with this system is the winds by Sunday afternoon. We're going to see widespread gusts between 70 to uh, as much as 100 kilometers per hour down along the south coast. The winds will stay uh, strong. We'll see a little bit of lull in them and then they're going to pick right back up again on Monday and then uh, you're looking at temperature or uh, rather winds speeds by the time Tuesday rolls around uh, down to about 50 to 60 um, kilometers an hour. So that's a look at uh, the forecast. I'm going to post uh, some stuff on my Facebook page if you want to check that out through the weekend as we get closer, just in case some things change.
Let's see who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 90th birthday this past Tuesday to Winnie Pittman from Labrador City, now in St. John's. And a happy 90th birthday today to Peter Connolly, who is, as I mentioned, 90. He lives in Benoit's Cove, originally from Woods Island in the Bay of Island. On Tuesday, Ernie and Ann Power from Point O'Mal, Port of Port, celebrated their 66th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. And a happy 50th anniversary tomorrow to Gerald and Bernice Russell from Labrador City. Happy 62nd anniversary two weeks ago on the 16th to Clarence Budd and Joy Squires of Deer Lake. On Wednesday, it was 61 years of marriage for Mabel and Eldridge Dumaresque in Lance Claire. Happy 50th anniversary today to Howard and Mavis Oldford in Mount Pearl. Elsie Guy turned 91 last Saturday. Elsie's in Musgraves Harbor. Congratulations. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Max and Phyllis Beckett, originally from Old Perlican, currently in Florida. Fred Rose from Bishop's Falls, who will celebrate his, or rather celebrated his 90th birthday this past Saturday. Happy 93rd birthday to Florence Humby uh, in Somerville. Her birthday was uh, Wednesday. And also on Wednesday was uh, the 50th anniversary for Joe and Roz Duffett in Catalina. Saul and Rowena Marr are celebrating their 58th anniversary. They're from Greens Pond, now living in St. John's. And this Sunday, Mary and Norman Lilly in Ramia will celebrate their 50th anniversary. This past Tuesday, Abe and Daphne Pittman from Deer Lake celebrated their 67th wedding anniversary. And a happy 91st birthday to Sophie Party from Harbor Mill. Her big day was on Wednesday. Yesterday, Lily Taverner in Clarenville turned 97. Happy birthday, Lily. And a happy 97th birthday to Mildred McGraw, formerly of Conch, now living in St. Anthony, and she celebrated last Sunday. Happy 91st to Alphonsus Benoit on Monday, and uh, he's from Marches Point, now lives in Kippens. Olive Smith with a big 102nd birthday, originally from St. Anthony. Olive lives in Stephenville Crossing now. Happy 55th wedding anniversary to Minnie and Les Wheeler of Grand Falls, Windsor. They celebrated on Saturday. And on Monday, David and Alice Bolin from Manuals celebrated their 52nd wedding anniversary. Scott and Josephine Rowe from Seldom Fogo Island are celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary today. Happy 60th anniversary to Reg and Grace Reeder from Cox's Cove. Tomorrow, Mac and Elizabeth Sutton will celebrate 56 years together. Leonard and Margaret Hines from Happy Valley Goose Base celebrated their 55th anniversary on Wednesday. Lloyd and jo Joyce Bath of Twillingate uh, wishing you a very happy 64th wedding anniversary. They'll be celebrating on February 2nd. And happy 50th wedding anniversary to Monty and Helen Tippett from Little Catalina. And happy 64th wedding anniversary to Harold and Teresa Coombs from Terrenceville. They celebrated on Wednesday. And yesterday was Fred and Marg Walsh's 60th wedding anniversary. They live in St. John's. Tomorrow, George and Shirley Nichols from Deer Lake will celebrate their 58th wedding anniversary. Also, a 58th wedding anniversary for Wallace and Marianne Tremblant of Charleston Bonavista Bay. They'll celebrate on Sunday. Happy 50th anniversary to Yvonne and John Percy in Brigus, who celebrated 50 years together yesterday. Happy 59th anniversary to Lawrence and Pearl Hillier from St. Jones Within. And in Mary's Town today, Bill and Emily Taylor are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy 55th anniversary to Jim and Marie Cotter from Melrose, who celebrated on Monday. And tomorrow, Walter and Linda McDonald from Burgio will celebrate their 53rd anniversary. Happy 65th to Sarah and Clarice Barney in Lancelou, Labrador. Happy 50th anniversary to Chester and Norma Harris from Burnt Islands. Colin Pike, he is celebrating his 91st birthday today. He's originally from Charleston, Bonavista Bay, but now lives in Gander. Happy 94th birthday from Gerald Linehan of Admirals Beach, St. Mary's Bay, now lives with his son in Perry's Cove. Happy 90th birthday to Owen Langdon in Northern Arm. And a happy 90th birthday today to Raymond Foster in Burlington. Bertha Mercer, nay Brown, is in Bay Roberts and she is celebrating her 99th birthday today. And Bertha is a survivor of the Buren tsunami of 1929. And happy 90th birthday tomorrow to Florence Gillum from beautiful Robinsons.
And we leave you tonight with a fun weather fact. Yeah, we're at the end of uh, January. We were one centimeter away from breaking the all time record for snowfall. That was actually December 2000. Yeah. So you see, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Buckle up, get your squeegee or your shovel, depending where you live. And Both. we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> Good night.